Before I ever went to Mount Everest, I saw every single YouTube video you could possibly imagine um, about what that mountain, what I'm in for, right? All these dead bodies, all these other things, right? Like, how do you do this? Welcome to the Spartan Decca series on Spartan Up with Jared Cogswell, Director of Sport, and Yancey Culp, Director of Programming. What's up, Spartans? Welcome back to episode two. Listen, put your seatbelt on for this one. In this episode, Mark takes us to the mountain. He conquered the seven summits. He gives us some of that real life visual with him on the mountain, some of the crazy brutal stuff that he dealt with, especially on top of Everest, coming down Everest. Listen, this is a great episode, team. Buckle up, let's go. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Duralane, a single injection that may provide up to six months relief from osteoarthritis knee pain. Risks can include general knee pain and pain at the injection site. You can see full prescribing information at Duralane.com. Mark, you know, you, you've had some extraordinary coaches in your, in your football career, you yeah. know, uh, NFL coaches, you know, those are the elite of the elite. Don James, Don James to me is, is he's the John Wooden of football mm-hmm. in, in a lot of ways. And uh, I'm sure you're, you're high. I mean, Mark was also a, a, not just a, a football player that, that uh, moved on to the University of Washington, but in Washington, but he was a high school All-American. I mean, that, that's uh, an elite level there. Um, but I also think about that community, that, you know, that you're from in that, in that Seattle area, you know, there are some legendary climbers in that area. I think about guys like Ed Veasters, um, you know, Jim Whitaker, the, the first ever American to climb Everest, uh, and the list goes on. You know, Fred Becky, the, the original. Yeah. Wow. Um, who were some of, yeah. Uh, who were some of your mentors and, and what was involved in the training for those seven peaks? It's really interesting because, uh, you know, certainly I was able to play with some NFL greats. When I got drafted to the Raiders, you know, my teammates, they'd been in the Super Bowl two years before. And now I'm out hanging with Howie Long, Lyle Zato, uh, Jim Plunkett, Cliff Branch, Marcus Allen, um, Matt Millen, Lester Hayes. You know, these guys were just all famous fo- football guys. And, and mm-hmm. while I love being a part of that community, I always had a mad respect for those guys that had actually climbed, in particular, um, Mount Everest. And like to your point, a lot of those guys um, grew up and they kind of cut their chops, cut their teeth um, on those mountains, you know, throughout the Northwest, um, based out of Seattle. And the cool thing is I've become friends with many of these people now. You know, Ed Veasters I've climbed with. He's at, Ed, Ed is actually in the movie that we can talk about here soon. Um, you know, Lou Whitaker, his son, who's kind of taken the reins now, Peter Whitaker, um, and a lot of these other ones. So, you know, you get into that climate community and you start going around, around the world and, and it's not just me up there, but I'm with a group and there's other groups and you get to know and you cross pollinate a little bit. And so it's been fun for me to rub elbows. And I still look at all those guys with mad respect and it's hard for me to see myself like part of that group. I know I'm part of that group now, but I don't see myself because I, I just have such mad respect for those guys. It's It's been... You know, just a, a wonderful gift to get to know those people and what they're all about. And and what did you do? Like, what was the first mountain that you climbed out of the seven summits? The first mountain I did, you know, I, I really needed a roadmap. Again, getting back to the pyramid of success and you know, like, where do you start? Right. And so mm-hmm. um, I'd called some people in the northwest and there's some people up there. There's several actually um, that run these climbing um, guide services. And so I'd mm-hmm. reached out to them and said, this is what I want to do. Where do you start? And so the mountain I went uh, down to first was in um, Tanzania, a mountain called Kilimanjaro. It's actually the highest mountain from floor to ceiling uh, in the world, uh, mm-hmm. because many of the other ones, you know, you start much higher up on the mountain. But, you know, that was a fascinating journey. I actually got to go do that twice and kind of, you know, I talked about the gifts earlier in the podcast. And one of those gifts was starting to do this and starting to get a social following and things like that. And um, Chris Long, son of Howie, played 10 years in the NFL. He started an organization called Water Boys. And so the whole idea was to build water wells uh, for the people. Um, Originally, it was just in Tanzania, in in the Serengeti for the people of the Maasai tribe. And it's now since expanded into East Africa. But 
It was amazing. I went down, there were seven uh, other NFL guys from various uh, veterans who had been wounded. And we went, we, well, first of all, we raised a bunch of money. Um, and then we went into these different villages and interacted with these people and just, just truly an amazing experience. And then we went as a team and, and climbed the mountain. So that was my second time I've been up Kilimanjaro. So uh, did that one twice and then um, uh, went on the next year to climb the highest mountain in Europe which is in Russia, like how often you go to Russia. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm doing vodka shots and, you know, in in uh, <laughs> these different places. But, you know, that was, that was a crazy. And then the next year went on to Australia, a mountain called Mount Kosciuszko, and then down to Argentina the following one year, uh, a mountain called Mount Aconcagua, um, 23,000 feet. So that was my first time going that high. And then the next year you know, on Denali up in Alaska, I got turned back. I mentioned that earlier by minus 80 degree weather. Went back again uh, in 2018, conquered it. 2019 down to Antarctica. And then uh, a two year span because of COVID. And then three months ago, I was on the top of Mount Everest. Yeah, awesome, awesome. What, what, was, the, what was the training that led up to uh, say Kilimanjaro? I mean, um, high altitude, long, a very, very long climb, a lot of endurance needed. What did you do to prepare physically for that particular climb? My, my, my training has really evolved over the years. I mean, I think, you know, in the first two or three mountains, I was, I was based out of California, Southern California. So, you know, I was doing a lot of mountain biking in the Santa Monica mountains and things like that. But it's, it's just a different level being here in training and really committing, like I said, to where I needed to be. I love it here in Sun Valley, but you know, being at 6,000 feet and being able to access mountains and getting vertical every single day. This last year, for example, you know, part of my trainings, and most of it happened during the winter, you know, I, I put on 150,000 vertical feet. Um, there's a thing mm -hmm. called skinning, which is putting a sandpaper type material on the bottom of your skis and you know, climbing up the mountain. And when you do that, um, you're able to really go anywhere and then rip those things off and ski down. And, and so 150,000 feet, um, you know, it's a lot of, uh, it's, it's a lot of exercising and everything else, but, you know, pretty much every morning I do CrossFit, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're a Spartan nation, um, people do. Um, so I do CrossFit every single morning and then about four o'clock after working throughout the day, um, you know, I strap on the, the shoes or the skins or the skis or whatever, and I'm off and I'm on that mountain. And so it's consistency, 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 which has really been the difference and allowed me to succeed and get to this goal. Awesome. Um, yeah, I got one more question, Yancey. I know I'm yeah, cutting you off, man. No, no, no. Go ahead, brother. I uh, apologize. You know, a um, lot of lessons learned in the mountains. Um, you know, some, some good, some bad, some you don't ever want to repeat from your seven summit quest. I mean, I'm sure you, you can write a book just on lessons learned. What would you say are your top two to three lessons you learned, uh, during this whole quest? <clears throat> Well, there's a lot of them and each mountain requires something slightly different. So there's lessons learned and there's just, you know, what I've kind of really brought away from. And I mentioned this earlier in the podcast, but I think the biggest one is stepping into the fear. And I think so many of us um, get paralyzed. Like, what if I do this and what if it doesn't work out and what's going to be the future? And you spend so much I'm stressing about what's ahead of you when you don't know the outcome versus just stepping into it. And it doesn't have to be Mount Everest and the seven summits, but it can be doing a Spartan race. It can be learning how to play the guitar or sing in a band or something. You know, nothing has to be, but doing something that's uncomfortable. And certainly a lot of the races that I know you guys have done and I've been involved in some of them, you know, I mean, they, they test you. Like, can I actually go do this thing? Yeah, uh, with all these obstacles, you know, in the way that we have to jump over this and that and climb up ropes and swing and, you know, like, can I actually do that and step in the fear and say, you know what, I'm going to try. And then the second, you know, which is right behind it is, again, doing the having that daily discipline. So you step into the fear and making sure that you don't quit and having that daily discipline. And then the, the third thing is, 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 is commitment. Like you're going to commit no matter what. Because I don't feel like getting up every morning like I didn't. I was dead tired this morning. And I have this thing called an FOF, which is a feet on floor. 
So I have to have my feet on the floor in order, because once they're there, I know they're gonna start moving. And it's one step after the other, after the other, and then ultimately it gets me through. And now here I am having a great podcast chat with you guys, right? And, and, and I guess that the flip side of that, the opposite of everything I just said, is is something called a new year's resolution so every december you know we say oh you know it's been a long year and i'm reflecting and you know now i want to lose 15 pounds or i want to do this or i want to do that and by march that thing goes out the window and that's because you know maybe they're stepping into the fear kind of but then it got too hard and then they bailed and that's the difference you know i keep going back to this and i just see it time and time and time and time and time again and it surprised me you know when i was going around the world like you know, not that everybody has to do this, but just in terms of the seven summits, there's since um, the guy who invented this is another guy I got to meet and hang out with, Dick Bass. Um, he owns Snowbird um, uh, yeah. Resort. And uh, and he started this whole mythical seven summit thing back in 1985. And since that time, there's been less than uh, 400 people that have actually, you know, completed um, the seven. And, you know, it gets hard and it's a journey and it's long. And... You know, being on, especially if you if you fast forward the clock to Mount Everest, I mean, what the, the, the I think the most surprising thing of all is that I'm living there for two months. I'm at seventeen thousand five hundred feet for two months, and I'm cold. And every night you've got a park on, and you're in a sleeping bag, and you're on ice, and you're on rocks, and you have avalanches coming down, and it's not fun, right? But it's the commitment to the end and seeing it through, and that's what you know, helps you drive towards success. That's going to, that's going to tie in pretty dang well. You set, set this up uh, pretty well, JC. I, and I'll be honest, this is one of those where if, if you decide you'd rather not have this in a podcast, it'd be fine with me. But I, I, I want, I want to try to get inside your head. You're, you're in Russia. You lose one of your climbing teams to a lightning strike. You, you know, and, you know you've got Everest coming eventually. In the from 2011 to 2019, there was an average of 10 deaths per year on Everest. That's going to be your final one. You're staying at 17.5 for two months. At any point in time, was there? And, I, and I, on the ascent of Everest, I, 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 I believe you're. You're seeing dead bodies multiple times throughout that whole process, especially on the on the on the final ascent. Um, just uh, it, 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 your level of fear uh, during mm. the process. You just talk to me about your level of fear and, and overcoming that. Yeah, well, you know, I think there, there's there's two things I want to I want to reply to on that, and we'll talk about fear first and. And that is, you know, I, I equate it a little bit like you don't go from the, the from Little League football to the NFL. That's impossible, right? And but and, and what happens is that there is these tiers and there's these steps. I'm in I'm in I was started when I was eight or nine years old in 89ers, and then you know I made my way up, right? And then I got into high school, and then from high school, I told you I ran into a a big obstacle called the University of Washington where I was in over my head and I was fearful. I mean, I was intimidated by those guys. And, but now I'm lifting weights and I go in there, I was six foot two, 181 pounds. I couldn't bench my own weight. When I left there, um, I was benching like 350 pounds. It was, I can't do that anymore, but it was insane, right? But I was strong and I was confident. And that, that just every little inch I moved down the field brought more and more confidence. And the same things with the mountains, you know? I'm doing all these smaller mountains and even mountain like Mount Rainier, which is still pretty intense. Um, but, you know, you're kind of going to that level. And then from that level, as you look at the seven around the world, Mount Kilimanjaro, even though it's high and it's long, um, there's no real technical skills that you have to have to go climb that mountain. You just have to be able to deal with altitude, you know, at 19,333 feet. And so you move through that and you say, wait a minute, I can do this. But, you know, what are the things that I need to learn? Nutrition, what you're wearing, um, uh, uh, hydration. You know, there's just all these things that all play into making a successful bid or not. And so the confidence comes by doing, doing, doing and keep kind of increasing the difficulty uh, as you go. As it relates to dead bodies, in 2019, I was 
I mentioned that I had climbed a mountain down in Antarctica called Vincent Massif. And there's a guy that became my tent mate um, the entire time I was down there three weeks. His name was Don Cash. And this is a guy that, in my opinion, good guy, but hadn't really put the time in. And um, he was just a mess going up and down the mountain, you know, always things falling out of his pockets and his glove and his water bottle and his ice axe. And it was constant and he struggled. And uh, three months later, he was trying to rush around the world and not really putting the time. And again, I talked about competitive greatness, which really means loving the process. And he didn't love the process. He wanted the T-shirt and he wanted the big picture, but he wasn't really willing to do and put in the work that it takes. There's no short, shortcuts to the top. And uh, so three months later, he was going to Nepal because he wanted to rush through this and go climb Mount Everest. So um, off he went. And if you guys remember in 2019, there was a famous shot picture that was taken with this gigantic lineup all the way to the top the bottom. And there was this big traffic jam and all these people died. Well, he was the first guy to die on Mount Everest that particular year. And when I was going up Mount Everest this last year, uh, three months ago, you know, I had to step over Don Cash. And that's pretty crazy and that's pretty wild. And as we're sitting here on a podcast, you know, it's hard to imagine that. But the state that I was in at that particular time, I'd become snow blind. I hadn't eaten in three days because we we're in a cyclone. Um, and uh, ultimately, I ran out of oxygen. There was so much of, in my mind at the time about just self-preservation. I acknowledged it. I saw him. But I didn't want to end up like him, of course. And so I just saw it and then just kept moving on. And of course, I went back over him on the way back down. Um, but, you know, it's a hard thing. It's the reality and it's sobering when you see these people. When I got up to 26,500, I crawled in my tent. I came out, you know, once I kind of organized my stuff. And uh, there was a, a body there laying in a tent next to me. It was all torn up. And you could see his hands and legs hanging out. It died on, on May 12th. And so... You know, it's real. And and Jared, something you had said earlier in the podcast about just a maniacal focus that you have to have when you're, you're out there. I mean, if there was ever a point in time where you have to watch every single little step and make sure you're clipping in and have, and, and I was at my wit's end. I mean, I was at my, my end. But there was, for some reason or another, the one thing that I was able to really focus on is just making sure that I don't fall off the mountain and do the right things. Mm. Thank you. We'll be right back to this interview, but first a message from today's sponsor, Doorlane. You know that knee pain can really slow you down. Sometimes that knee pain is due to osteoarthritis, a disease that affects some 14 million Americans. Learn about osteoarthritis knee pain and how to alleviate it at oaneepainrelief.com. You'll find information there about non-surgical, non-opioid treatments for osteoarthritis knee pain that may help delay the need for knee surgery. One treatment you'll find there is Doralane, a single injection that may provide up to six months of relief from osteoarthritis knee pain. It's indicated for the treatment of mild to moderate osteoarthritis knee pain when conservative treatments have not worked. Risks can include general knee pain and pain at the injection site. Full prescribing information is at Doralane.com. Spartans say no to limits. You can learn more at oaneepainrelief.com. That's oaneepainrelief.com. All right, back to the interview. Talking about your experiences, um, you know, I, I'd start thinking about, you know, those, those mountains and those routes you've always wanted to climb, right? Like they've been on the radar and the ones that you, you end up wanting the most are the ones that you fail at. And I, I remember, you know, you know, Mount Rainier, Liberty Ridge was, was one of those for me. And I remember when we finally got it, um, it, it, it was emotional. You know, it was, it was a three year quest. I wanted, I wanted Liberty Ridge. You went out and climbed seven summits, the highest peaks on every, every continent. And when you came off of Everest, you know, obviously you, you had some hardships while you're up there. How can you describe the emotion after you got back to, to safe ground? Well, I look at it, it was a big whirlwind to say the least. You know, um, I, you know, like I said, it took, I was out there for 18 hours. So think about all your athletes that, you know, you're on these endurance things. And I think your furthest race, you might be out there for a while, but it's not 18 hours. 
and and you're not up in the death zone and you know where there's a third less oxygen and you're not most of your athletes probably don't go out without eating you know the you know in that morning you know and have full of energy and so that night um i'm going to answer your question but i also want people to know that when i got down in in uh to my tent this is about 6 p.m um i ultimately crawled in there and on my way down, I'd run out of oxygen, and then I ran out again about nine, ten o'clock that night. And uh, one of the Sherpas had come by, and he had said, "Hey, how are you guys doing?" I said, "I ran out of O's." You know, people die at this this altitude, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I ended up net net. I ended up uh, uh, spending the entire night with no O's. Um, they said they didn't mm -hmm. have any more, which they did, but. Um, it was just one of those crazy things that happened. I'd actually was out running around twenty at, at that camp, twenty six thousand five hundred in bare feet, looking for tanks. You know, you just start to lose your mind. And then the next morning, when I when I'd gotten up, um, uh, it was a little bit of chaos. And and on my way down, um, I thought I was the first or last person leaving camp. Turned out I was the first. I went down down the mountain by myself. And so, you know, I was just, the only thing that was on my mind was getting a helicopter, somehow or another get flown off this mountain. And so we got down there and the cyclone started to come back in, a lot of snow, clouds, so the helicopter, you know, couldn't come up. They only fly if it's, if it's crystal clear. Next morning, this is now the 24th, I, I uh, climbed down uh, to Camp 1 with the, 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 the idea was we're gonna climb all the way back down to base camp at 17.5. And now we're at about 20, we start at 23, no, 21.5. And um, when we got down to camp one, this is about 6 a.m. in the morning, this, the skies parted and a helicopter came in and was able to take myself and this other gal and fly us up the mountain. And then we, we flew down to, we flew over the Kumba Ice Fall. We flew down into uh, Everest Base Camp again, 17.5. And then uh, we were able to get another uh, helicopter to come and pick us and take us from there uh, back to Kathmandu. And then we got COVID test and then the whole country shut down. So I had to charter yet another. So these were all private charters, not not cheap. And then I, I ended up uh, getting, uh, and I was working with like the Nepal, you know, I don't even know what they were, you know, the, I don't even know one or business they were in, but somehow or another, I was on a private charter and I was flying to Qatar. Now who goes to Qatar, right? So I'm flying to Qatar just to get out of the country. And, and meanwhile, all my teammates got stuck on the mountain because the cyclone hit hard. They were stuck for another two weeks up there. I'm the only, myself and this girl are the only two that got out of, out of the country. Well, none of them get, get, get off the mountain, but then get out of the country. So when you're asking the question, what was, you know, there was, it was such a whirlwind. I mean, it was just like, I felt like I just survived 180 days at sea. I mean, it was literally like that. I was worn out. I'd lost 25 pounds. I hadn't eaten. I was a mess. And I just wanted out. I'd been up there for so long. I just wanted out. Oh, so, you know. Mark, you got, you got me thinking about a couple of things here. Um, the picture behind me is one of my former climbing partners that unfortunately uh, perished in a wingsuit accident in Norway. And uh, I've lost, uh, I lost another climbing partner. And you mentioned Ed Beesers. And Ed and Michael back here behind me uh, were actually good friends. And so it, it's just kind of cool to, to be connected uh, to you in this way. But my question to you, you know that it, it's, it's a sacred relationship between climbing partners because you're roping up and putting each other's um, lives in, in one another's hands. What would you say is, is um, you know, what makes a great climbing partner for you? Boy, um, you know, number one is commitment, uh, desire. Uh, the ability to handle um, just being at altitude. I mean, there's a lot of people who are great athletes, but they just can't handle that, that altitude. Somebody you can mm -hmm. completely depend on, you know they're not going to bail on you. They're, you know they're not going to, to flake out and insist in for themselves. They're a team player. That's huge. Um, uh, I think the, the reliability, um, there's always, always that chemistry. Um, and that's why you see like guys like Ed, you know, I've gone with these professional mountain guides and that's been the, probably the, 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 it's been a blessing and a curse at the same time because 
Ed Veesters has been sponsored most of his life by Eddie Bauer and other people. And so he can pick and choose who he wants to go and be that teammate. And the way it's worked for me is none of my, my buddies want to climb with me or go with me because they'd rather play golf in Palm Desert. And so I end up on, on every single one of these mountains. I've just signed up and I'm one of 12. And you have no idea what you're going to get. And every single time, we had a guy on um, Denali, my first Denali in 2017. He was from Taiwan. And he'd really never done any kind of high mountaineering. And, you know, we got on a 45-degree a uh, ice wall. Uh, and, and the guy was going to absolutely die if we would have left him up there. And he just laid down. He says, I'm not going any further. I'm done. And we were all exposed, sitting over a gigantic crevasse. And it was getting late in the day, and the storms were coming in. You could see him out there. And, you know, with the, he put us in a bad position, right? So the dependability factor was unknown for all of these guys and, and, you know, and girls. And some of these people, you know, turned out to be rock stars, and some of them haven't been. And it's just the wild card of climbing with, with people that you just don't know. Hmm. We've, uh, we've had a lot of amazing guests on. And there's always, there's always things that we get, always golden nuggets we get that uh, people that are never going to have any aspirations to, to do the seven summits or play in the NFL or, or many of the great things that, that, that you've done, Mark. But uh, when I look back at BHAG and, and FOF, you know, those are two things that relate, can relate to every single human walking the planet. We can. Uh, there, there's people that that will watch and listen to this, and uh, we, we all need a big, hairy, audacious goal, and, and we all need the fire in our belly to not not let our feet hit the floor in the morning until we're ready, ready to dominate the day, and then say, "Let's freaking get out of bed and 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 let's go." Um, you've obviously lived a life of uh, of a lot of hags and uh, dominating the day with with FOF, my my friend, and. Those are uh, those are two acronyms that I I never had implemented in my life, and I'm uh, uh, I love that they are now. Well, let me let me give you one more, and, and like, like I'm not some genius. I mean, trust me when I say this. Um, but I think the two things: one, the power of curiosity, right? And and for me, that's just like certain people have the ability to achieve at high level, and so if you drop down from that to me. Um, I, and I, I say this often because it applies to myself, and that is success leaves clues, right? So success leaves clues. So who are the guys that are, are, are the champions at business or the champions at sport and race or the champions at, at whatever they do? It doesn't matter. But if you're somebody who's aspiring to be one of those people, look at what they do. There's certain patterns and traits that each single one of these people do. And for me, you know, like in business, I didn't know what I was doing, but I aligned myself with business people in Seattle at the time who had a clue. Um, and I would go to them and I'd seek advice and I'm like, hey, I'm trying to do this. What do you think? Hmm, that's interesting. And then I'd go and explore that. And then I'd go to another person. What do you think about this? How would you approach it? Hmm, that's interesting. And the same thing has been in mountaineering with Ed Veesters. Before I started this whole, whole journey, I climbed Rainier with, um, with Ed. You know, it was, a, it was amazing. And so it was just like, what do these guys have to do? Before I ever went to Mount Everest, I saw every single YouTube video you could possibly imagine um, about what that mountain, what I'm in for, right? All these dead bodies, all these other things, right? Like, how do you do this? And so that's something that's really helped me is just trying to keep that in line. And then the last little nugget I, I, I've given my daughters, I used to give them this every single day. Um, as I drop them out, they're like, you know, fourth and fifth grade and they open the door and they've got their lunch boxes with Mickey Mouse, you know, all this stuff. And I go, Hey girls, just remember this. It takes a little more to make a champion. It takes a little more. And when down in my little fitness center, I put in my garage with my Peloton and I do my CrossFit stuff on the wall in big, bold letters, it takes a little more to make a champion. And if you think about it, you know, again, it doesn't matter if you're trying to be the best CPA of all, but if you want to go the extra different difference and have a point of difference between yourself and everybody else and succeed at different things, you got to go the extra mile. And that's again, where people did do just enough to get by. How can I, you know, only work three hours versus six, 
you know, and check out how can I just be on a walk every day and that's going to prepare me to do some big massive athletic goal. It's not enough. And if you want to be a champion, you got to put yourself out there. Thank you for that. Well, Mark, we are excited to see that, that movie. Um, and we'll definitely be checking it out. Um, how can people contact you? You know, the best way is just go through my website, markpattisonnfl.com, and uh, hopefully you've got an audience out there that will see this. You can also live stream the movie, by the way. Well, it, I tell you what, on, on behalf of our team here, you know, we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, congratulations on achieving the seven summits. Uh, not, not too many people on, the, on this planet have ever done that. And, uh, you know, Mark, I, I think what's the, the coolest thing about you, you are, you are definitely a great human being uh, for all of us. And uh, we appreciate your, uh, your uh, inspirational story and uh, the, the lessons that you're sharing. Thank you so much, guys. You, you did a great job. And, you know, look at uh, I, I, I pull my pants on like everybody else. And, and at the end of the day, it's just through heartache and a lot of ups and a lot of downs, a lot of peaks, a lot of valleys that, you know, I'm sitting here today. But, um, you know, there's a lot of points in my time in my life that, you know, it hasn't been so rosy. And so I think as I sit here today and we look back and there's certainly been some highlights, but there have been some seriously down moments, too. And it's, you know, what I've been able to do to actually pull myself out of these different dark moments. So, I mean, I think that's the big, the big takeaway for me, you know, to your audience is that, you know, we all go through bumps and just keep moving. That's the biggest thing. Keep moving. Or we can keep climbing. Keep climbing. <laughs> keep moving as you climb. As Jared says, keep climbing and no whining. <laughs> you know, there's, I'll, I'll leave you guys with this and then we, we can, we can depart. Um, the great Martin Luther King said this, and this was certainly applicable to me because I literally would have been another statistic on the mountain, uh, three months ago, if I hadn't done this, which is if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl, but whatever you do, keep moving. Thanks for listening to this episode of the DECA series on Spartan Up Podcast. Spartan Up is your partner in resilience for mind, body, and spirit. We're here three days every week. Tuesdays, you can find Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan, interviewing biohackers, business leaders, authors, and athletes. Thursdays and Saturdays, catch episodes from our DECA, Endurance, Trail, Combat, and La Ruta series. Do you know someone who needs a little nudge? Maybe they could use some motivation, tactics to be stronger, healthier, happier, more successful. Tell them about our show. And if you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. We want to know who's watching and who's listening. Thanks. See you next time. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Duralane, a single injection that may provide up to six months relief from osteoarthritis knee pain. Risks can include general knee pain and pain at the injection site. You can see full prescribing information at Duralane.com.